Hello, welcome to chapter five, risk and return. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to talk about obviously risk and return. And, you know, so the first formula we're going to go over is the holding period return. So before I review this, let me talk a little bit about this concept of return. So, of course, this is the reason why we invest. So people are motivated to invest in an asset because of expected returns, the possibility of making more money. So returns is the profit from an investment. I think we pretty much all understand that. So it's a reward for investing. So this is the reason people invest, obviously. So if you're gonna put money in something very safe, like a savings account, you're gonna expect a low amount of reward or return. But if you're going to invest in something much more riskier, like a stock, you'd expect to have a higher return. So, of course, the return is going to depend on the level of risk you take on and your expectations. And then there's also the reality of how the risk uh, translates into actual return by the change of the asset price. So, while some, some investments have more of a guaranteed return, most don't. So, the return on you know, a bank deposit that's insured by the federal government is a pretty certain return, but investing in a bond or a stock is much less certain. And that um, expectation of return and the existence of risk is what we're going to talk about in this chapter. So when we talk about holding period return, we're really talking about what percentage are we going to get as a return percent for an investment. So the return on an investment is going to come from two sources. It's going to be basically um, any type of income we may receive through dividends or interests, and then the change in the underlying price of the, of the asset, which is capital gains. So income, if you're owning a stock, that's going to come in the form of dividends, uh, mutual funds as well. And then if you have a bond, income would come in the form of interest. Uh, for the purposes, you know, and that's pretty common events. Capital gains is what we call when we buy at one price and the price moves up higher. So if you buy a stock at $10 and then the stock goes to $15, you made $5 of capital gains, which, you know, so here, if this is <clears throat> the formula, we have the sell price minus the buy price plus the dividend or any income divided by the buy price. And this will calculate into a percent. So here's here's an example of some input. So I'll give you a second to try to calculate the return of this information. You can pause the video if you need more time. But basically, if you translate this information in the way I look at it is new price minus old price plus income divided by old price is how I usually say it in my head. Uh, and this would be a 13% return. So not a bad return. Um, now, if we want to calculate the capital gains yield, uh, we just want to look at the ending stock price minus the beginning stock price divided by the ending stock price, or as I usually say in class, new minus old divided by old. And that's going to be 8%. So without the income, the return is only 8%. And even with the S&P 500, if you look at the returns of the capital gains of the S&P 500, with and without the dividend payments, is a, it's a big difference. So dividend yield would just be the income or dividend divided by the beginning stock price. So together, the 8% and the 5% is what make up the 13%. Pretty simple. Now, there's a couple different ways we can measure um, return in different periods of time, a couple, a couple of different mathematical formulas. So we have three of them off the bat. An arithmetic mean, uh, mean is just another word for average, I'm sure you know that, geometric mean, and a weighted dollar average in return. So the arithmetic average is just the annual returns. So we take the sum of the uh, annual returns and divide by the number of years. Very simple. And it's the average of past returns, you know, is a common forecast for perhaps predicting future returns. But past returns is not, um, we would say, a 100% accurate predictor of future returns. So we have the geometric average. So the geometric average, this would be um, 
of quarterly returns uh, is equal to the single per period return that would give the same cumulative performance as the sequence of actual returns. So we calculate the geometric average by compounding the actual period by period returns and then finding the single per period rate that will compound to the, the same annual value. And I'll show examples of this on the next slide. And the dollar weighted at return, so a dollar weighted return or average return, um, this is going to account for varying amounts under that's going to be in a portfolio. Or, and we're going to treat each uh, fund cash flows as we would a capital budgeting problem in corporate finance. So if you remember corporate finance, this is sort of incorporating the time value of money or what we would say the internal rate of return of a portfolio. Uh, and again, I will show you some examples of how to calculate this on the next slide. So the next slide will show the, and I'm also going to, of course, in a um, Excel video, show you how these are calculated as, as well. So um, here is, here's some information. So assets under management, the start of the quarter, and the holding period return, the total assets before net inflows, then net inflows, and then uh, assets under management at the end of the quarter. So this is just going to be these two numbers added together. Okay, so the arithmetic mean, how we calculate this, is we would take, um, these are the percentages. Uh, so these are, it says 10, but it's 10%. So 10% plus 25% plus negative 20% plus 20% divided by four, since there are four quarters. So the mean would be an 8.75% return. So the geometric average is one plus the return so for each quarter. So one plus 10% is 1.10, one plus 25% is 1.25, one plus negative 0.20% is 0.8, and one plus 20% is 1.2. So we're gonna multiply the four of those together, and then we're gonna divide by one fourth because we have four quarters. So it's one over the number of periods, and then we're gonna minus that total from one, <clears throat> and we get a, a geometric mean of 7.19%. Okay, so. Now moving on to the um, dollar weighted. Now in the dollar weighted, there is a little mistake here. So this should be, the decimal point should be here. And, and this is a, they just made a little mistake when uh, putting the slide together. So this just, let me block this out. Okay, so it should be, uh, negative point one, because coming from up here, the, the net inflow. And you see here that we have the point 0.5, the point 0.8, but we're missing this point 0.6 here. So it's another um, thing that they should have added here. Um, a negative point 0.6. And then to that, they're going to add the Uh, the value at the end of the fourth quarter, the 1.56. So you can see this, this formula here, this example, is, is not quite fully correct. So we're not going to go ahead and correct that. We'll do that in the spreadsheet. But the important thing here to remember when you do a weighted average is you're trying to, what you're trying to discover, you know, the solution here is zero. What you're trying to discover is what is the internal rate of return. So the answer to that is 3.38. So if you put 3.38 into the dollar weighted equation, then the, the returning uh, net present value or, or the answer will be zero. So we're trying to put the total value to zero. So what rate would drive the ending value to zero based on these factors? Uh, so this is better done in the spreadsheet. So we'll look at this in the spreadsheet. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about uh, annualized rates of return and effective annual rate. And you probably remember this from your uh, finance class. When, so when we're in finance, this is something that's part of the internal rate of return chapter. And it's, it's pretty common. Uh, it, it's, just a, it's just how the interest rates are basically displayed. So 
Now, the effective annual, what do they call here, the annual percent rate uh, and the effective annual rate. So there's a difference between, between these two, and it's significant. So, uh, so th you know, basically there are different ways to calculate the annual rates. So these are two of them. And when we look at the, what we normally refer to, we don't call it annual percentage rate, we just say APR. And you probably heard that term APR before. Um, so this rate is not equal to the rate at which your investment funds are actually going to grow because this is the annualized rate. So if you have a different number of periods that you're going to have, be, you're going to have compounding, the actual rate of return is going to be the year, the effective annual rate. So the annual percentage rate is in many cases, unless your rate, unless your um, compounding is annual. So if you had annual compounding, then the annual percentage rate would equal your effective rate. But if you don't have annual compounding, and a lot of most investments are either quarterly, semi-annual, or monthly, you're going to have uh, because this annual percentage rate is going to ignore compounding. So the effective annual rate is going to build in the compounding and give you what effectively the rate of which your money is going to grow at. So here are the two formulas. So in order to calculate um, the year, you need the effective uh, the APR and n is going to be the number of compounding periods um, and then if you have the effective annual rate you can calculate the apr so you need one of those two rates to, to start out with and compounding periods would be if you're if you're going to receive interest quarterly then n would be four monthly n would be 12 daily n would be 365 uh, semi-annually n would be two now if you had continuous compounding um, that would be kind of a rare situation, but we do have a formula uh, for continuous compounding. And that also something I'll show you in Excel. Okay, so nominal interest rate and real interest rate. So let's talk about these two items uh, next. Okay, so the nominal rate of return is, it's an investment. So when, basically, how can I explain this? It, um, it's the return that investment is going to earn expressed in current dollars. Um, so for example, if you put $50 into an investment that, that promises to pay 3% interest at the end of the year, you would have a 51.50 and 50 cents. So the initial uh, investment plus a, um, $1.5 of return. So your nominal return is 3%. Uh, but this does not necessarily mean that you're better off financially at the end of the period because the nominal return does not take into account inflation. So, um, so for example, say at the beginning of the year, uh, you bought a bag of groceries and there's been a 3% uh, inflation. That means at the end of the year, the bag of groceries would cost $51.50. So in other words, at the beginning of the year, you would have used your $50 to either buy a bag of groceries or make an investment promising a 3% return. So if you invest your money rather than buying the groceries, at the end of the year, you have $51.50, enough to buy one bag of groceries, so you're pretty much where you started. So the real rate of return, or the real interest on an investment, measures the increase in the purchasing power that the investment provides. So, you know, going with that same example, say the real rate of the real rate of interest return on that example uh, before in the fifty dollars is zero percent because inflation matches your return. So the rate of return of three percent uh, in dollar terms um, increases your wealth by three percent, but the purchasing power of that uh, wealth is the same as when you started. So the actual real rate of interest or return is going to be zero. So um, nominal rate of return minus the inflation rate is going to give you what your real rate of return is going to be. So uh, in this particular slide, what we're looking at here, if we look at this slide, uh, this is the, <clears throat> here's the formula here where R represents the uh, real interest rate and capital R is the nominal rate of interest. I know it's a little confusing, so, but there's a difference between a capitalized and a lowercase letter in these variables and I is the rate of inflation. So in this example, um, we have an investment earns a nominal 10% return during a period of 5% inflation. So it would be the 1.10 plus divided by the 1.5, uh, and, and that's going to be uh, about, four, uh, if we boil it down, 
uh, 4.8 percent would be the r so one plus r is going to equal um, this equation which is 1.48 so if you take away the one the 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 real rate of interest is 4.8 percent so just an example of that so it's important to keep in mind that inflation plays a factor of what your real return is and that's something that investors are always trying to beat inflation to actually get a return so the equilibrium nominal rate of interest so this would be the fisher equation and this is r equals lowercase r plus e to the i e to the i is the current expected inflation which is quite frankly an estimate the nominal interest rate and the lowercase of what we just go before is the real rate of interest so that would be uh, how you would calculate that okay so let's look at interest rates and inflation and real interest rates over time so in this particular slide we have you see we have the blue are the treasury bills and the the black line is the inflation so you can see um in times of a war or recession and um uh, in, or pre-recession inflation can spike up and generally when inflation spikes up the treasury bills have to have to follow and you see that the inflation is sort of a leading indicator here the treasury bills have to follow because they have to compensate more than inflation so there are points where your uh, real interest rates can vary greatly depending on the movement of inflation and how fast inflation moves because inflation moves faster than the treasury bills because um, treasury bills are a reaction to the inflation okay but you know in the last you know 20 years or so the level of inflation and level of uh, treasury bills have been a lot closer there's been a smaller distance between or a smaller real rate of interest between the two so as far as the u.s history of interest rates inflation and, and real interest rates um we could state as this slide states since the 1950s nominal rates have increased roughly in tandem with inflation which we uh, kind of got a sense of that in the previous slide um, and there's been volatile pick periods um you know due to war or severe recession that can affect that you know and that's why investments go a little haywire during those times so let's switch over to scenario analysis and probability distribution so this is going to be a little bit more statistical so um so um in looking at risk or measuring risk uh, we're going to start with this question of what the holding period returns are possible and how likely are they to occur so this is where the scenario analysis comes in because we're going to look at the possibility of economic different economic outcomes which we call scenarios and the probability of each of these scenarios is, is something that we're going to estimate and we're going to we're going to try to incorporate into our scenario analysis to get a pos different possible outcomes that we could put in the probability distribution uh, so this is these different probabilities will place mathematically or statistically into a distribution and we can consider you know if it's a portfolio of stocks or a stock index we're going to look at this scenario analysis based on different scenarios we put together and the probability distribution is going to help us to measure both the, the risk and the reward of the investment and the reward from the investment is what we're going to call an expected return uh, so so scenario analysis possible economic scenarios such as worst case scenario most likely scenario best case scenario could be three exa examples the probability distribution is going to be the possible outcome so we could put a percentage factor we have a 25 percent chance of a worse outcome a 50 percent chance of a, a, a uh, an expect a medium outcome and a 25 percent chance of a better outcome so that would be your full 100 percentile and then we're going to use this you know the expected return is going to be the mean value of this probability and we can calculate the variance and we're going to use the um, standard deviation um, which is going to be the square root of the variance uh, now and the variance is going to be the square deviation of the mean so this is all statistical stuff that you've done before um, fairly uh, certain of it so let's look at this scenario and again i'll run through a couple of these in the spreadsheet but in this particular scenario, we have four um, possible outcomes. Severe recession, mild recession, normal growth, boom. Uh, 
Okay, so here are the probabilities. And remember, your probabilities have to equal one. So 30, 60, 100%. And then the holding period return, this is what we're gonna, what we are gonna estimate would be the return in these four scenarios. So if we multiply column uh, here B by C, we're gonna get this uh, result here. Okay, so then we have multiplying, this would be column B and column C. You can't see that because it's basically a spreadsheet here. We get these results and then we're gonna find the sum. Um, no, actually, before that, we're gonna do the deviation from the mean. So we're gonna calculate the, um, the mean and then we're gonna find um, that <clears throat> deviation from the mean. So here is uh, the results of that. And uh, so basically, I well, this is the mean here. The expected return would be the mean. So the deviation, so if we have a negative 11 minus a 10%, negative 21. Negative 37 minus 10%, negative 47. 14 minus a 10%. So this is, would be how we calculate the deviation for the mean. And then we find the, um, we square these returns here. So 20 times 20. Um, so column B uh, times square is a deviation. And then <clears throat> from there, we get the sum of these uh, squares, and that would be the variance. And if we find the square root of that, we get the standard deviation. So again, better to, to see how this calculates in a spreadsheet, but this is an example of how you're putting a scenario analysis together. Um, using uh, to calculate expected return, variance, and standard deviation. So what this is going to tell us is um, it's going to put it into a distribution, which we're going to, we're going to come up, I'm going to show you here, we're going to show the distribution later. So this is, you know, to transform the distribution return into a standard deviation score, uh, this is the formulas we can work with here. Well, basically, if we plot it on a normal distribution, we could look at a return of 10% and standard deviation of 20%. Uh, so what that means is if we do one standard deviation, it's going to be plus or minus 20%. So we start at 10%, minus 20%, we get the negative 20, plus 20%, we get to 30. And this would be one standard deviation, which is a 68% chance of occurring. If we have two standard deviations, we, we're going to increase it to a 95% chance of occurring, and three standard deviations would be a 99% chance of occurring. But you can see as we increase the percentages by increasing the, the number of standard deviations, we also increase the range of this um, distribution. So the most likely set, 68% for one standard deviation, you have a 68% chance of getting a return of negative, somewhere between negative 10% and 30% is what we're looking at. So, um, and that's useful for gauging risk. So the tighter the distribution, the less risk, the wider the distribution, the more risk that we're looking at. Okay, so the, um, the normal distribution, so when returns are very short time periods, we uh, call it normally distributed. So, you know, normal distribution is going to be center to the theory um, and the practice of investments. So it's going to be that uh, bell-shaped curve um, to identify values sort of in that distribution we were, we were talking at, where the mean is going to be the, you know, the expected, and then we can add plus or minus the deviation to that. Um, so this is basically, if I go back a slide, we talk about that normal, this is the, the, the distribution, normal distribution curve we're talking about. And it's, it's useful for graphically de depicting the risks. So now there are some other mathematical uh, models here. Now we talked about the variance and we showed to calculate the variance and then the standard deviation. The higher is the standard deviation, the more risk. And remember that the standard deviation is only measurable against other investments with 
equal expected returns. If they don't have equal expected returns, we could use a coefficient of variation to help um, make them similar for analysis. So the time series of returns can be a scenario analysis derived from a sample period of history of returns. So we can look at the past history, the volatility of the returns to kind of get what the distribution is to help us figure out what the riskiness of the investment would be moving forward. And the standard deviation is going to estimate those series of returns. Now, uh, um, so these are all statistical things that we're going to apply to return the history of returns to get the likelihood of extreme events occurring. And so we have this other measure called a, a VAR or value at risk. So it's going to measure the downside of the risk. Um, you know, so, so this is another thing that we can kind of we can kind of look at and basically um, it's sort of like a cutoff. It's going to distinguish, you know, from the common notation of the variance. So a loss adverse investor might desire to limit the portfolio's uh, uh, VAR, you know, uh, to a particular threshold, usually around 5%, you know. Okay, so let's talk about risk premiums and risk aversion. So the risk-free rate, this is what we've talked about in the previous chapter is the rate of return is going to be earned with um, a high amount of certainty, sort of like a three-month treasury bill. A risk premium is going to be um, expected returns above that risk-free rate. So if the treasury is at 3% and your investment was at 4%, the risk premium would be 1%. Uh, ex uh, excess return would be the rate of return in excess of the risk-free uh, rate. So that 1% would be the excess return um, now, risk aversion is what an investor should be, which is reluctance to accept additional risk without some sort of additional compensation. And the price of risk is going to be the ratio of the risk premium to the variance. So we could use this uh, Sharpie uh, reward to volatility ratio. Uh, so, so it's going to be the ratio of a portfolio risk premium to the standard deviation. So uh, here we'll show this is the uh, actually uh, rank, if you want to rank perform portfolios with the Sharpie ratio, the, uh, the portfolio risk return premium divided by the standard deviation of excess uh, returns is going to be basically abbreviated to this formula where we're going to get our expected returns of the portfolio minus the risk free rate divided by the standard deviation of the um, portfolio's excess returns is what's going to calculate our Sharpie ratio, which is another way to, to measure risk and premiums you know, within a portfolio. So if we look at um, the excess return statistics in the market, here is the different market periods and we get the average uh, expected return, the standard, well, this is the actual return because it's in the past, uh, the standard deviation of these returns, and then the Sharpie ratio. So you can see here that the in 26 to 27, the standard deviation is high compared to uh, the average. And even and then when we have lower returns, so these are not easily comparable. That's why we go to the Sharpie ratio to give us a com better comparison of the return statistics because it's hard to take the averages and standard deviations and say which, risk, which period is riskier, but we could use the um, Sharpie ratio to help measure that. Okay, so let's look at the historical world um, portfolio. So if we look at the, um, large stocks from 24 developed countries, so we're going to talk about around 6,000 stocks, U.S. large stocks in Standard & Poor's um, 500 would be the largest cap. And then, of course, U.S. small stocks. Um, the smallest 20% of the New York Stock Exchange, the Amex, and the American, the American Exchange. The American Exchange has, however, been folded into the New York Stock Exchange. World bonds, um, same country as the world's largest stocks, and the treasury bonds of uh, the long-term treasury bond index. So there's some historical uh, records here. So, so if we look here, we can look at the T-bills, T-bonds, and stocks from this 
90 year or 89 year period, we can see the arithmetic mean of the three stocks are higher. The risk premium, so there's no risk in treasury bills, but the risk premium T bonds and stocks are higher. Standard deviation, so you can see that standard deviation here, stocks is higher than treasury bonds, but they're not comparable because they have different expected returns. But we could look at the minimum and maximum returns, and you can just see the distribution here it is a lot smaller than the distribution here. So stocks are the most volatile as far as um, having the highest standard deviation and the highest dispersion. So again, just giving you a sense that stocks are more riskier than bonds and treasury bills. And if we look at it, we plot those historical returns um, of uh, treasuries, percentages of observations, we can look at, you know, we have sort of a tight distribution here. And if we put uh, treasury bonds, we have a bigger, you see a more varying or a bigger distribution here. And then we finally put stocks on, we have the biggest distribution variation here. So you can graphically see the stocks equities are more riskier. Okay, so let's move into asset allocation. So in asset allocation, we're looking at how we're going to um, put a portfolio together. What, what are going to be the broad investment classes between stocks and bonds, large stocks, small stocks, international stocks, domestic stocks. So some sort of allocation um, needs to be set up when creating a portfolio. So a complete portfolio, the entire portfolio, including risk, risky and risk-free assets together, and the capital all allocation, the, the uh, choice between risky and risk-free assets. So sort of, you know, if you had a portfolio of large cap stocks, small cap stocks, uh, long-term bonds, and short-term treasuries, uh, that would make up the complete portfolio. And then you would have to figure out um, the choice of the percentages in your asset allocation between those uh, capital pools. Okay. So uh, the risk-free asset. So this we've talked about a few times. And we're just going to reiterate it here because it's important, specifically when we talk about the capital asset pricing model later on in the textbook, we're going to be covering a whole chapter on that, which is important for the uh, portfolio theory. And as, as well, this chapter on risk and return is the fundamental start of portfolio theory. So treasury bonds, you know, they're still affected by inflation uh, because these are longer term bonds. The price index government bonds and then, so these are the price index covered bonds are what we would say uh, could be, just trying to give you an example of it, the weighted against inflation. The money market instruments effectively are risk-free from default and risk of the CDs, the commercial paper, is very small. Okay, so if we're going to consider these risk-free assets, I think treasury bonds would be uh, risk-free in the sense that the government's not going to default on them, but there is still some risk of inflation. The price index government bonds, which I see those to be inflation adjusted bonds would be risk-free because you'd be free of the risk of inflation and the risk of um, default. Money market instruments are backed up by the federal government. So those are considered risk-free. NCDs are also, um, certificates of deposits are insured by the government, but commercial paper is has some risk to it because it's not insured, but since it's short term, it's considered uh, more risk free. Now, if we're gonna do the expected return of a complete portfolio, this would be the, the basic underlying formula. And again, we could calculate this in a spreadsheet later on. So expected return, of a complete portfolio. So it's basically just looking at the portfolio and the return of the weighted average of all the components within the portfolio, you know, uh, to calculate, you know, hopefully use the, the, this, we could use to calculate what the expected return is, but it doesn't mean that's gonna be the actual return. And we already went over the standard deviation uh, and we can incorporate the standard deviation for calculating the complete portfolio standard deviation. So instead of doing standard deviation of a single low, a single asset, we can calculate the standard deviation of a portfolio. And then this could be uh, what we have here is a capital allocation line, and that's an application of 
a result of some of, some of the, the standard deviation calculations that we put um, together. So this, uh, we, you know, we can call it CAL or capital app, app, um, allocation line. And when we, when we look at this, what we're trying to figure out is the, how does the, you know, the, this mix work. So if we're going to plot this risk return combination available of various dis different capital al allocations. So by choosing different values, uh, we can kind of see how the, the capital asset pricing line equates the increase in expected return the investor can obtain per unit of additional standard deviation or, or sort of the equivalent of extra return for extra risk. So this is sort of graphically uh, the Sharpie ratio, our way to use the Sharpie ratio in calculating, you know, uh, expected return and standard deviation as a measure of risk. So it's just a graphical application of the, the formulas we've been, we've been calculating in this chapter. Now, so if we so if we step back a minute, this is again, the, you know, the plot of the risk return combinations. So it's a tool. We can kind of plot, tweak the portfolios and the combinations to see varying allocations of riskiness and risk free and plot them on the line. And the risk aversion and capital allocation, what we're trying to figure out is the preferred capital allocation, which is going to give us the highest amount of return with the lowest amount of risk. And we can use this um, uh, available risk premium to variance ratio compared to by the required risk premium to variation ratio. Here's the formula here to calculate that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on to a passive strategy and the capital market line. So a passive strategy is going to avoid any type of security analysis. It's really just saying, here's a typical passive strategy. Let me buy the S&P 500 index and just hold that. So I'm not going to make any active trades. I'm just going to hold the stocks within or just buy the, um, a mutual fund or ETF in the S&P 500 uh, index. And my passive strategy is just set it and forget it. Just buy that, hold it, <clears throat> and accept whatever risk and return I receive. Now, capital market line, this is going to be a capital allocation using the market index portfolio as a risky asset. So... <clears throat> The so another way to say that is the CML is a passive strategy using the broad market stock market index and the risky we use it as a risky portfolio um, which is going to generate an investment opportunity that we're going to represent as a CML. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next slide costs and benefits of passive strategy. So the passive strategy, one big, real big advantage of that is it's very simple. You just, like I said, that phrase, set it and forget it. You just buy the S&P 500 and hold that for your whole retirement. And it's going to be very inexpensive because you don't have to pay a lot of money in transaction costs or commissions. And the expense ratio of, a, say, an active mutual fund would be as high as 1%. And for the expense ratio of hedge funds, that can be anywhere from 1% to 2% plus a 10% of returns above the risk-free rate. So these mutual fund averages, uh, the expense ratio for mutual funds and hedge funds are very high, while passive investing in index funds that you invest in are some of the lowest expense ratios you'll find. Now, you're paying higher expense ratios to compensate the active management for those um, more active uh, trading strategies in mutual funds and hedge funds. So the passive strategy is going to give you, the you know, they have to compete um, and they're trying to maintain the, the similar return to the S&P 500. So costs have to be very low. And it's very administrative wise, it's very inexpensive to host one of these funds and sell it to investors. So this is one big benefit is the reduction of costs associated with uh, a passive strategy because there's really no active management to fund. So it's a good, it's a very, um, the cost effectiveness kind of makes up for the fact that you're just getting average returns and 
if that is, and most times that's going to be the active return set by a lot of mutual fund managers who are actively trading. Okay, so that's the end of this first chapter five on risk return and, and historical returns. Um, a couple things I want to mention. So um, the techniques for, for quantifying risk of an investment are quite useful, and we've gone over some of them in this chapter. However, they'll be of little value if you are unaware of how you feel towards risk. So individual investors are, are typically seeking answers to the questions, you know, is the amount of perceived risk worth uh, taking to get the expected return? So can I get a higher return for the, same, for the same level of risk or can I earn the same returns while taking less risk are good, very important questions. And that's what a lot of fund managers are trying to do is enhance the returns and minimize the risks. So they are, um, and it's, this is what it's all about. A lot of this analysis and the statistical use is to try to figure out what is an acceptable level of risk for my investments. So it, individuals, of course, are going to differ in how they're willing to bear risk in the return uh, that they're going to try to compensate that risk. So broadly speaking, we're going to say that you know investors' attitudes towards risk are defined by three distinctive categories where investors' you know uh, preferences regarding risk are vary in fundamental ways. Uh, so there can be some people who are risk indifferent to investors who require return. The required returns do not change as the risks change. So this would be kind of a, not a great stance for an investor to take, sort of, sort of be blind to risks. Most investors would fall into what would be a risk adverse, where the required return need, the required returns need to increase as risks increase. Uh, because they don't like assuming risk and they don't like increasing risks and returns have to compensate for any increasing risks of an investment. Some investors who may be day traders are very speculative, they might be risk seeking. So these are simply, they enjoy the thrill of taking risks and they're willing to give up some return, to take on more risks. Think of somebody who's gambling in a casino or, you know, so that's not a smart way. And typically, um, you want to know where your risk lies. And if we had like a risk scale, things like government securities would be lower risk, bank, uh, bank accounts and certificates of deposits would be lower risk. And then as we move up, um, you know, bonds would be riskier, mutual funds would be riskier, um, common stock, individual common stocks would be riskier, and then options would be even riskier, and then futures would be the most risky on a scale of, and that's why with future contracts, individual investors are really barred from trading those because the risks are just so out of control. Um, so overall, your decision-making process, you want to combine how you look at risks to how, what your return is. So that's why we want to use this historical um, calculation of risk, uh, some of these statistical measures we talk about in this chapter to get a better perspective of the risks that were previously assumed and the returns associated with them. So we can evaluate this risk return characteristics to get better idea of the investment options and the potential um, increase of wealth and the potential risk to the decrease of wealth. So you, and so investors, you know, typically uh, investments that offer the highest returns with, with the lowest association of risk is where investors want to be. And that's not always easy to see. So very talented, uh, very talented investment advisors and investment analysts who can sniff out and recognize these investments that are going to have lower risks in the future and higher returns. That is where they want to and want to place their investors into those, and that could be some individual stocks. So if someone was, you know, in the early days of say Amazon or Netflix, and they were looking at okay, these stocks have a high amount of risk but the expected returns are going in the future, they can project that the expected returns from these stocks are gonna be much greater. And as the companies grow uh, and their base of customers and subscribers grow, the risks are gonna greatly decrease. So these were investments that if you had, um, were, had a good perspective and, and you were able to realize the risk return um, trade-off of these stocks early on, you could have made, in some cases, 10%, 10,000% returns uh, overall in this period. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. I will see you for the next chapter. Uh, thanks for your time. Take care.